John Calabris, it's 27th of April, 2022. Welcome to BRI Dialogues. Thank you so much, Ali, and, and thank you, Anush, for uh, the honor and the, and the personal pl pleasure to meet with you and have hopefully a very robust discussion. Well, we live in interesting times and from the vantage point of where you are sitting, um, what do you think is the impact or the context of everything that is happening and BRI significance in what is called a post, you know, neoliberalism world that is shaping and, you know, brewing in the global south, a, you know, post truth world. Where is this dynamic going to take us with, with, within this framework? And what is the weight of Build Back Better World and all these acronyms? Where are we, John, today, if you want mm, to? Th thanks for the question. That's, uh, that's a big one. <laughs> uh, and so soaring of 40,000 meters above, uh, above the planet, you know, let me, let me offer a few thoughts. I mean, a, a couple of the acronyms or uh, neologisms that you mentioned, post-truth, post-neoliberal world, let, let's start with that. I, I think that what we're seeing here in the United States, and it's not new, and I, it's, it's, it's occurring across Europe and in other parts of the world as well, is what I would call the kind of loose formation of a coalition of the disaffected. And this, this disaffection, I think, uh, you know, takes different specific forms in, in different countries. Um, but what I think it represents sort of in a, in a kind of like meta or transcendent way is an erosion in, you know, significant segments of, of populations of confidence and trust in public institutions and the capacity of government to actually accomplish things that change their lives in a positive way, or at least, you know, arrest what they perceive to be like, like their decline. Here in the United States, you know, if I may offer just a few, you know, I wouldn't call them gems of insight, but a few passing you know, uh, observations, is I think that coalition of the disaffected, um, you know, constitutes different, different groups. I mean, you know, for, for some, particularly among the political class, you know, th this is something to, uh, to kind of trumpet, to champion, to ride. Um, it's, a, it's, it's kind of like window dressing really for, uh, you know, uh, basically a way to grab and to retain political power. But beneath the political class and throughout society, I think you have a number of different contributing factors. You know, one of those, is the hollowing out of the middle class in the United States and the exacerbation uh, of you know, differences, not just in terms of like personal income, but wealth and, and opportunity. And you see this you know, most profoundly uh, you know, among young people uh, who you know, to some extent expected, I don't see them as feeling, you know, I, I work with young people as Anoush does and you know, I don't see them as feeling you know, like entitled so much as looking to the future with some degree of trepidation because things that you know their parents had worked hard for and that they're determined to work hard for you know seem to, to seem to be like unattainable so you know i think that that's just like one of several sort of sources of discontent uh, now how does this translate into the bri or build back better or you know kind of international relations you know more more broadly I think that um, from the perspective of the place that the United States occupied or likes to think of itself as having occupied as kind of, you know, playing a leading role, a role that other countries or, or conditions, you know, within the country that other countries and other people uh, would like to emulate or, or respect or, or in some ways admire. I think that um, the United States is sort of decline in that respect is, is, is pretty significant. You know, I mean, when you look at the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, it's really hard to sort of, um, you know, separate uh, that and its negative global reverberations from, you know, the, the, the practices and malpractices of, of Wall Street and, and hedge fund and insider trading. And then you find out the way in which the United States government, which is maybe not the captive of Wall Street, but is dysfunctional to the point of view that they were really unable or, or unwilling to kind of like redress some of those problems that I think, or, or systemic, um, you know, elements that sort of 
poisoned uh, not only the US economy and society and resulted in all this dislocation, but, but how this kind of, you know, kind of reverberated around the world. Secondly, I think that the Iraq war, at least from my perspective, I, I just think that this was like a catastrophic uh, uh, strategic mistake whose effects are still being felt. And, and I don't mean it's just still being felt in terms of the way that, you know, the dynamics of intra-Gulf or intra-Middle Eastern politics are concerned. But I think in terms of like what it represented in terms of the United States, that the United States really could not be believed, you know, that it had lost credibility and the way that it mismanaged the reconstruction period, not only reflected, like I think, badly on the United States and lowered countries' confidence in the United States, uh, sorry, uh, credibility of the United States, but I think that it, it, it struck a, a really damaging blow to, the con to people's confidence in the United States. And maybe that confidence was overblown. Maybe people and governments th sort of thought of the United States as bigger than the United States really ever was. But the United States really, I think now has been sort of, you know, how would you say, cut back in terms of its size and its image and its stature. Uh, mainly, but because of the, you know, like own goals, right? And, and that's one of them. Now, how does that, how does that like match up with, with the BRI? I think, you know, the BRI, China, I think has sort of rode these trends. Uh, you know, China in terms of its discourse and in terms of its policies, you know, portrays itself. And the BRI is sort of the mega project that kind of, you know, illustrates this. Um, it, 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 it it, it sort of it, seeking to position itself as an alternative to the kinds of policies and the kinds of big power policies that the United States and its allies have pursued for decades. Um, I think it's trying to sort of straddle this um, uh, um, in terms of its own sort of identity and, and, the, and, the, and the image that it wants to project. Mm -hmm. But it's a major power on the one hand, but still a, a developing country on, on the other hand. And I think it's, it's, you know, the BRI, I think, is an attempt to kind of blend those two um, components of its international personality in a way that then says, you know, you come to us for the things you need. We'll provide it with no political questions asked and no conditions attached. And that's a different sort of animal with a lot more material assets to provide these days than what you're accustomed to. Very interesting you say that, and I'm gonna stop for us uh, in a second. It, it reminds me of uh, the story of a um, uh, quote from Woody Allen that says, half of life is just showing up. So, so China is showing up in Global South. And, you know, I was reading a report a while back. It says in the United States, uh, U.S. Um, Association of Civil Engineers has identified 850 bridges that have structural fatigue in the United States. So, so I think this building bridges in a context of metamorphical kind of approach in Global South is one thing, but the ability to deliver something that is functional in a reconstruction, back to your point on Iraq as well, is something I'd like to revisit, but I want Anush to jump in. You know, I think BRI's context in reconstruction as well is something, John, that we would love to have your thoughts on. Okay. Uh, Anush, would you like to uh, I've got, in or I've, would you? I've got, I've, I've, got, I've got a series of issues <laughs> that, that I'll be, uh, I'll be waltzing uh, through with you, John. Okay. <laughs> The, the, the first one relates to what you, you, you said a minute ago about the hollowing out of the middle classes. And that's a phenomenon that we have, of course, in Western Europe as well. And, you know, the French elections last Sunday is a classic example of what it means when you've got, if you like, anti-establishment forces, uh, you know, that pretend to be vanguard of civil society, you know, you, you get, but it, you know, France is not unique. We've got our problems here in this country as well with the, not just with the extremes, but also with our ruling governing party. But these are countries that have championed globalization, you know, on steroid for half a generation. And as a consequence have seen their middle classes squeezed because of that massive profit margin that was built on the back of Chinese workers and industrialists, if you like, right? Now, 
we've we've got the reverse moment of this, where it's the Chinese who are saying, guys, honestly, globalization is really good for you. Don't turn within. Don't worry about supply chains. We'll work all this out. And yet, you know, the elites in the West are looking at saying, maybe maybe your globalization is not quite what what we bargained for. Um, and we want to find an alternative. Alternative, obviously, is something that horrifies Beijing. But given what's going on in Ukraine as well, how do you see this kind of this reverse process where you know the Western democracies are now hesitant, and it's China through BRI and through advocacy policy is very keen to ensure that this process of open borders investment and exchange continues because of course China profits from it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, let, let, let me start with this thought is I, I don't know that we're necessarily in a period of reverse globalization from the Western perspective as much as an adjustment of globalization. I don't believe that, that I think the sinews of economic interdependence, even though many of them sort of, you know, are sort of asymmetrical and produce winners and losers, both, you know, between countries and within societies, I, I think that they're just too dense to just, you know, un, like sever. But I do think that um, these adjustments are taking place, that there is decoupling occurring, um, and that it's probably going to take place first and foremost uh, from the Western perspective when it comes to, um, you know, cri critical strategic elements or co commodities or, 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 or manu you know, products, whether we're looking at you know, lithium for batteries or whether we're looking at you know, microchips for components in electronics and computers. So I, I think that, you know, I think that there, I mean, maybe I'm wrong about this, but, and maybe this, this, maybe this really is a, a matter of my wishful thinking more than like sound objective analysis, but I do think that the decoupling will be selective. I think that it'll be limited. What I do think though, is that there is kind of a cowardice at the political level um, in the United States and Europe and in other countries that have profited from globalization by and large. Um, and and who rather than really to take the Chinese like challenge, you know, head on, um, I think that they're capitulating to this kind of narrative that globalization can't be in a way like reshaped um, or that, you know, the economic, let's say, and social bargains within countries can't be reconstituted in ways that produce like more, you know, equitable results. So I think that, you know, even the Biden administration and, and of course, you know, Hillary Clinton before that really kind of um, sort of, you know, played, was forced, I suppose, for electoral reasons to play the hand of the economic nationalists. And, and of course, once having done that, it then makes it doubly difficult in a competitive political environment to walk that back. So I do think in a certain way, you know, like the, in the United States political context and, and you know, maybe in the UK and elsewhere, I, I think that our leadership has sort of in a way trapped us uh, and that we've now, we're now in a, at a point where we've oversold the, the kind of evil and the ills and the, and the adversities brought about directly and indirectly by globalization such that when it comes to maybe wanting to, con to continue those things which, which can be beneficial if, if, if reconstituted and adjusted, we, we can't because then, you know, the finger of blame, you know, you guys are basically walking away from your campaign promises. Very interesting. Um, talking about decoupling, I want to bring it to you. You wrote beautifully in one of your most recent articles, and there was the headline was tying China in. And it was about UAE and GCC and Saudi Arabia and bringing the you know maritime Silk Road. 
How well do you think Middle East can maneuver or manage this decoupling between China and now Russia, OPEC plus, and, and the, the ambitions of remaining as the maritime hubs, whether it's Jebel Ali and the rest of it, and America coming down and saying, I don't want you to be too welcoming. How do you think they have to manage this, John? Well, I, I mean, I know what my, if I were they, which I am not, I know what my goal would be, and it would be to derive as many economic benefits as possible from the linkages that have already been established and those that could, could be established or reinforced with China, while at the same time trying to ensure that the United States remains like a reliable security guarantor. So that would be the kind of you know, act that I would perform. Um, now, a lot of people, including myself, I think, have, have maybe erroneously referred to this as a balancing act. From the, from, you know, I, I, in a way, I don't think that that's correct. Mm. I mean, looking back at it, I think it's a misnomer. I think it might be better to talk about it in Bill Clinton terms. I hate to bring up his name, but, you know, I mean, he did this in politics in the United States. My wife abhorred that approach. But, you know, I mean, I would say that they ought to be, and they are struggling, I think, to triangulate to try to send messages to the United States that you're not indispensable, right? And, and we, can, we can do this with the Chinese. And then to reach out to the Chinese and to see to what extent they can curry favor and, 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 and kind of you know, derive benefits from, from that. So I think they're trying to play both sides. I think that they're trying to leverage this kind of position in this very fluid environment and the way in which the major power competition has begun to kind of migrate to the Middle East from the more Eastern region reaches, let's say, of this vast and amorphous, you know, in, uh, Indo-Pacific area. So I think, but you know, I think that like the US, if they played their cards more smartly than they appear to be, they try to triangulate too, right? Rather than to throw up their arms with this kind of like hyper alarmism about the Chinese, like, you know, intrusion into the region, I think what they ought to be doing a little more of is sort of reminding, you know, the traditional partners in the Gulf and elsewhere of what the United States still possesses uh, and the potential that it has. And, you know, what would it be like if we really did? Uh, you know, withdraw from the region? And are the Chinese and or the Russians really capable or willing to replace us? And do you really have this kind of, you know, very ephemeral idea of a new regional security architecture? And can you implement that if we're gone? And for the Chinese, I think, you know, they're in their own predicament too. It's not just like, I think, 100% opportunity for them. I think, you know, they got a lot of equities in the United States. I was looking at estimates of Chinese foreign direct investment. I was like struck by it. And I really have to corroborate this. But, you know, with, as bad as the relationship is between the United States and China, they're still pumping billions of dollars into the American economy in terms of mergers and acquisitions. And as much as the United States is trying to like wall ourselves off from the Chinese, you know, that stuff is not just trickling in. You know, it's, it's coming into the United States. And the Chinese, I think, like, they don't, they profit, they're free riders, they, they profit from the United States, both blundering in the Middle East, and, and also, you know, maintaining some degree of, like, stability in, in the Middle East and the Gulf. I don't think they want to relinquish that. I don't think they want to replace the United States. I mean, I think that, you know, if you believe that the Chinese are at least, like, inscrutable you know, almost immortal figures who are thinking 7,000 years in advance and like, you know, but we don't understand that. And every step they take, word that they utter, uh, you know, action that they commit is one step closer to the ultimate goal. And one day we'll wake up and we'll see yeah. that like everywhere is Chinese. You know, I just, I just don't buy it. I think it, it's, 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 it's a crude misrepresentation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John, we were here, of course, in the 70s with Japan, when mm. the yellow peril was suddenly yeah. over the horizon, you know, having crushed them through two nuclear weapons, how dare they rise up 30 years later to challenge American hegemony and industry and so on. And, you know, you'd go back and look at Hollywood, you look at the literature, even academic literature was all brazenly anti-Japanese. 
uh, and, and many colleagues from China uh, are very upset about this, that, that, you know, it's the same stereotype kind of a badge that you're sticking on us just because we are different, you know, or that our cultural approach to diplomacy is very different than yours as well. But going to this point of this triangulation, John, let me pose a slightly different proposition. And that is, uh, I think, you know, the Gulf is, we probably have now got it, that China is no substitute for the security uh, parameters, that actually China does not want to play that one. So imagine a scenario where they get this, but they're too shy to admit it for the moment, okay? And we have JCPOA going on in Vienna, that both Tehran and Washington apparently are desperate to sign off, but they don't want to be seen to be doing it in public. So they're finding for kind of ways forward. Let's assume that happens, which at least provides the US and Iran some assurances of a, a, a kind of a clear blue water between them, and that America provides the assurances that the GCC countries want as a consequence, okay? And then look at China, which it does want JCPOA to succeed, obviously, because it opens on Iran's market big time, but the, what will happen to the equation now where China seems to have brotherly relations with the Saudis, Emiratis, and the Iranians in the absence of the Americans in Iran? What happens with the Americans are more or less on board and, and the Chinese can't play that card any longer? How will that triangulation then filter itself through, do you think? I'm, I'm glad you asked this question. I, because it gives me an opportunity to kind of like to imagine, right? And academics can imagine. Remember, we can't predict, but we can imagine. So let me imagine a, a JCPOA 2.0 sort of success story. Let me precede that by saying that, you know, for as long as trying to resurrect some version of the JCPOA uh, has been going on, you know, it, the agreement has always been like next week and next week and next week. I think no matter how strategically desirable, like reaching a final agreement is, and, and to both parties, right? I, I still think, it, you know, we've yet to, but we've yet to see the agreement. And so what's strategically desirable might prove politically impossible. And I think we should come back to that because I think that, you know, domestic politics and the deep seated mistrust that underlie it, both in Tehran and here in the United States in particular, I think, you know, we've seen, I, I wouldn't say many, but we've seen certainly more than one instance where domestic political politics, at least from where I sit uh, in DC and also looking at it from a distance in Tehran has really stymied like some kind of rapprochement or, you know, between the two sides. I mean, you know, taking the JCPO out, the, the first one, like out of the equation. Okay, having said that, let me imagine. So. JCPOA then, uh, uh, you know, comes to fruition. Um, there are, you know, political opponents and critics who descend on it uh, in both capitals, but nonetheless, then we move to implementation. How does this potentially change the equation? From the US perspective, I think it changes the equation like in an interesting way, going back to the point about triangulation, right? Because if I were Americans, I would, Americans have been spending the last five, six, 10 years trying like, to strategically reassure their traditional security partners. And the worst case scenario among those who, you know, the nightmare scenario for Gulfies is that somehow the US and Iran go back to the kind of relationship that had existed during the time of the Shah, okay? Um, so I think if I were US policymakers, I would sort of quietly, uh, you know, remind our Gulf partners that it, that is a possibility. You know, or let them, let them imagine that, right? I mean, you know, then the, the shoe is on the other foot, or let's just say the United States has leverage of its own. Second point is, I think that if I were Iran, or the Iranian leadership, this whole, whole thing about, you know, look to the East, blah, 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 the $25 billion or however much it was, MOU with the Chinese, 400 you know, billion, John. How, how many? 20, to, to 400 billion, 25 years. <laughs> yes, yes. 10, 10 trillion. As, as was once said in a movie that I saw twice and fell asleep both times, but I remember one line, show me the money. 
show me the money. And, you know, yeah, in fact, let's go to that, okay? Um, I don't think the, let's just say, consummation of this promise has been forestalled exclusively because the JCPOA hasn't been consummated. I think that the Chinese have multiple reservations about, you know, big time investment uh, in Iran because of the mismanagement of the Iranian economy and because of endemic corruption and because of the kind of risk factors um, that would accompany, you know, the, I mean, implementation, I think, you know, they may race to start up certain contracts or to resume certain forms of business. But there's always gonna be that kind of shadow or that kind of uncertainty that lingers over the implementation stage, you know, not to the point where, you know, sanctions may be reimposed or snapped back or that, you know, God forbid Trump would be reelected and then the United States would walk away again. But I, I you know, I just don't think that the Chinese would be as enthusiastic, nor would necessarily the Iranians be as enthusiastic about being swarmed by the Chinese. And, and what I saw after the 2015 deal was that the Iranians for all the big talk about look to the East, were also looking to the West. And if I were the United States, I wouldn't necessarily, if I were American companies, for example, I wouldn't necessarily race back into Iran, but European companies will. And European energy companies will. And, 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 and if I were the United States, I would encourage it. Because looking at now Europe's predicament, right, like undue um, uh, excessive dependence on Russian gas, right, well, there's something called Iranian gas. And so in terms of like the longer term and diversifying sources, Iran back into the sort of, you know, international fold strategically means Iran back in terms of like, you know, in uh, capitalizing on some of its potential in terms of let them sell oil to the Chinese and let them sell gas to the Europeans. And, and if I were the Iranians, that's how I would play it. That would be my triangulation. And if I were the United States, that's what I would encourage, right? And how would this then play in terms of the Gulf? Well, you know, what it might do is it might reinforce a, a kind of like solidarity between like, you know, Arab Gulf players, and it might also maybe reinforce solidarity between uh, Arab Gulf players and, and Iraq, or Arab Gulf players in Egypt, or Arab Gulf players in terms of like trying to extend the detente with Iran. You know, I don't think that would necessarily uh, produce a more divisive, uh, more contentious, more kind of like unstable um, uh, strategic uh, um, in, it's environment in the Gulf. Anyway, those are just some like meandering thoughts. I don't know if any of them make sense no, or no, in no. any way realistic. You, 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 you said uh, academics cannot predict, but they can imagine. And I uh, salute that imagination and I welcome that. The question is just two days ago, people like Senator Menendez and others are saying, forget about the deal, we should walk away. And so there is that hanging, you know, um, yeah. worry, even for China in the context of everything you are saying. And I wanted to bring it back a bit to the monetary realm, um, um, John. If, um, you know, this OPEC plus and this flirtation that Saudi has taught about or gave a hint that we may be wanting to sell our oil to China in renminbi, do you see a day that comes that GCC currencies can depeg from US dollar? Because that's as well a worry at the moment. I heard that, uh, you know, there is a massive sale of yachts and luxury uh, assets in uh, 650 million, Anush, uh, I read two days ago that they are offloading. So there is this worry that what if we are next in line of frozen assets, frozen, you know, um, investments in United States and get hit in the head as well. So can, can in that sense, the outcome of Russia be an alarm clock for 
new development bank, the structure, where do you think the fiscal dynamics are leading out of this and uh, the impact on BRI and RMB for that matter? Yeah, I mean, this kind of take me into a little foray into an area that I, I can't say I'm, I'm a specialist in. I mean, I have a few kind of superficial thoughts and please correct me if I say anything that's like really way out of, you know. No, we uh, welcome uh, everything you want to share. Go ahead, John. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Allow me to discredit myself immediately. Uh, okay, so here we're really talking about, I think, at one level, like the sort of, you know, supremacy of the dollar and its sustainability over the longer term as a reserve currency, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I mean, from what I understand, you know, roughly 80% of all transactions are denominated in dollars. And, and so, you know, what's true, I don't know, in Montenegro is true in the Gulf. In that in that respect, um, but and and I don't think that let, let's let's zero in on the case that you mentioned, which is Saudi Arabia, right? So for five or six years, as far as I can recall, there have been these discussions between China and and the kingdom about um, you know selling sort of some oil uh, in exchange for yuan, but it does appear that you know the developments that have been occurring since the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the sort of reaction on the part of the United States, which is essentially to you know wage economic warfare against Russia, that it's definitely not only rekindled this idea, but that it 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 could well result in like at least on an experimental and partial basis, a, this kind of a transaction. Right now, if you play that if you play that out over the longer term, I guess it is possible, because Saudi Arabia is such a big player, um, that um, not only might that experiment be emulated by other countries in the Gulf and other countries generally, but that over time that could you know erode or damage this you know the kind of uh, dominance uh, 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 of the dollar. But I think you know that's that's a long way off. And like I say, I don't know enough um, about sort of the financial system writ large um, to know like what the United States is, you know, countervailing actions might be to, um, you know, offset or manage that. I mean, in terms of dollar pegs, you know, Kuwait already, and I don't know when this started, but, you know, Kuwait several years ago um, sort of began to take a, um, a like a, a kind of basket of, yeah. of, 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 of currencies. So, you know, I'm not, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not as panicked about this happening. You know, I'm not sure if this is like, a symbolic message to the United States, because I do think that MBS has sort of taken a few shots across the bow, you know, not taking the phone call with President Biden about, you know, the administration's request to pump more oil into the market, you know, this. I think that there are a number of, let's call them uh, initiatives, but are they really initiatives? Are these really like, you know, harbingers of fundamental transformation? Or are these being messages um, and are reminders to the United States that we count, we have leverage, don't take us for granted. And you know, what's what's being received on the US side? You know, how are they kind of um, how are they uh, interpreting this and what responses might they make? I'm, I'm sorry, I really don't have like a lot more on this. You know, I, I did read your question over email, Ali, or your, about like the new development bank um, and the establishment of this multilateral like BRICS founded uh, bank. You know, the more the merrier. I mean, I don't understand. I mean, I don't know why that represents like a Chinese takeover of the multilateral, you know, finance mobilization. I mean, just a couple of days ago, you know, India and the UK established this kind of, uh, what was it, this kind of like partnership, um, investment partnership, global investment partnership, where, 
the UK and India and, you know, unnamed but flexible third parties would try to marry public sector and private yeah. sector financing for sustainable projects in fourth or fifth or sixth countries. So I see all kinds of like experimentation. China's doing its it's, but you know, the West, and then you have Britain and India, which are a combination of North and South. You know, I think- I wish everybody was as enlightened as you are, John, but I'll, 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 I'll wait for Anush to weigh in. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I hear you. I, I, I myself, uh, Ali knows, I'm not, um, you know, over worried about, or, or, or see this as, as a possibility. And there are a number of reasons, but the most important one of which is that the amount of dollars that China itself holds uh, will, will completely undermine the Chinese economy if it were, everybody went to Renminbi's and started uh, selling off their dollars because the collapse of the Chinese currency would ensue uh, and they'll have to buy a lot more dollars to sustain it. Um, so it, it can, it, I, I think they themselves would not want to see the dollar replaced that rapidly, partly because you know, a dollarized global economy also holds American economy hostage to a level as well. Yeah, and great point. That suits some of America's adversaries out mm. there too. Yeah, great point. It limits it limits fiscal policy making in 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 the U.S. and we've seen it over and over again that that's that 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 has happened, uh, particularly when you've got a, a now a, quite a powerful eurozone that can weigh in when there are these transatlantic tensions that, that come in. You, you, John, you mentioned um, Ukraine and the war, which is my kind of segue into, into that horror story, uh, which, which is absolutely terrifying uh, on so many levels. You know, we, we obviously worry about food security in a place like, like the Middle East and the Arab world that you have views we would love to hear it because you know from Lebanon from Syria from Egypt uh, from from the GCC countries from Iran uh, from North Africa the message is very dire about not so much with security but price security for staple diets that's a real concern um, I'll let you engage with that one before I ask you my my, my other question sure yeah, I mean, I think we can come at this from two different angles. One is um, from the perspective of Russia, right? Which is to say that the United States has its cards to play and its allies, and Russia has its own cards to play, and commodities like are its card, right? It's a Trump card. I mean, really, what does Russia produce? Um, oil and gas and uh, wheat. Okay, and you know, you could conceive of from the Russian perspective this as an opportunity for them to kind of, you know, play that card. Uh, I'll come back to that like in a second. Because I mean, you know, what really concerns me is that it this wouldn't be the first, it's not the first occasion where, you know, like food in a way has been directly or indirectly like weaponized. I mean, we've seen it in other conflicts and, and here we see it like on a massive scale just because of the repercussions, some of which you just mentioned, right? I mean, together Russia and Ukraine, if I'm not mistaken, account for like something like 29% of of, of of wheat exports in the world. You know, looking at the most recent figures, and I think it's too, you know, it's premature to see like how this is gonna play out uh, for a couple of reasons, right? I mean, number one is we don't know how long the war is gonna go and we don't know how long the sanctions are gonna hold. And, and the third reason is, and this gets back to what I mentioned just in passing, we don't, we don't know like what the capacity is gonna be of those other countries that do produce wheat to kind of, you know, increase their production level in a way that would narrow the gap between what the Russians and the Ukrainians had been supplying and what like other leading existing suppliers could do to um, provide some, you know, buoyancy, right? But you know, I think Ind Indian production is up, Canadian production is up, but. 
the amount that looks like it might be taken off the market by Russia and Ukraine is still significantly larger than, you know, the kind of incremental gains that have been made by those other leading producers. So that's, that's I guess, like, like point one. Point two is that you're right. I mean, prices have gone up from what I could see on average of like 60%. I mean, that might be... Um, digestible, if you'll pardon a bad pun, by, you know, affluent economies uh, or affluent segments of particular, you know, of any economy, but for the vast number of people in the global south, I mean, this is, this is a disaster, you know, waiting to happen. Um, I mean, the, the food, uh, uh, the FAO, um, just last year produced a study, I believe, that said that, you know, literally tens of millions of people across the wider Middle East were already malnourished. Uh, and their caloric in intake was already sort of below, um, you know, the, the minimal recommended standard for, da you know, daily sustenance. And because wheat and bread, um, you know, account for a significant um, fraction of that daily caloric minimal intake, you know, that it just in terms of human health and looking at security from a human security perspective, right? This is bad news, uh, really bad news. Of course, when you're thinking about, you know, Lebanon and you're thinking about Tunisia and you're thinking about Egypt, of course, and you're thinking about even Turkey um, and Morocco, uh, then you have to be thinking not only in terms of human security terms and, and malnutrition, right? And that being exacerbated, but the possibility of that leading to social discontent and that social discontent then sort of creating like political disequilibrium across the region, not to say that we're on the brink of facing, you know, uh, you know, Arab Spring too, but I mean, just look at Egypt where you had pretty significant bread riots in 2008, 2011, 2017. And, and, you know, this is a big deal. Now you listen to the Egyptian authorities and they're saying, well, we have stockpiled things, we subsidize, right? Number one, I don't believe that that's credible. And number two, even if it were credible, again, right? Again, it's a matter of for how long will those subsidies and or that stockpile hold out? This brings us back to the financial system, right? Is that, you know, to what extent uh, uh, is the financial system, meaning multilateral institutions and the World Bank, for example, or IMF bridging loans, to what extent are they, um, uh, you know, able, willing, and in pre-crisis mode or in crisis mode, not just to, uh, to, to basically um, sort of, you know, fill that gap, make it possible for those countries in the, in the, in the Middle East and elsewhere in the global South to continue or raise those subsidies. Of course, you know, even that uh, may not be like the magic bullet or the silver bullet to, to, to deal with the situation. Looking at China though, it's kind of interesting. I mean, when they say they have huge stockpiles, uh, I don't doubt it. Um, A, because they had the currency to obtain it and B, because the party state apparatus uh, seems to be like, you know, always looking over its shoulder and, you know, ready for the next like social uh, discontent to boil over and, it, and, it, and its political power to be threatened. So, I mean, they may be in a safer situation, big as they are, right? And big as consumers, right? Um, but the rest of the developing world in the Middle East, uh, you know, I think it varies by country and their ability to kind of, uh, sustain themselves uh, is really going to depend on, I think, the course of the war and the sanctions. Anush, you want to go with your second question or should I jump in? Go ahead. I jump in. If you jump in, I'll go <laughs> I, I'm doing I'm, uh, lip, uh, lip breathing and, uh, you know, but I wanted to um, as well bring this to the context, John, and have your guidance that, you know, applying sanctions is always easy. In the case of Iran, we know removing it is, is almost uh, as hard as applying it um, uh, uh, in, in terms of removing it is as uh, not as hard as applying it and the ramifications are uh, you know long term 
Apparently, um, the Chinese companies, oil and gas, CNPC, Sinopec, are all picking up Western assets in Sakhalin too, in Eastern Russia. Haven't these crises and the sanctions in effect for those who are a bit, as you said in DC, are mindful and worrying about China, made China stronger in one way or another? I mean, this cherry picking of discounted assets because of sanctions that, you know, today as well, the gas tap was momentarily shot on Poland. Where is China not the beneficiary, the ultimate beneficiary of these crises in way or another? In wow. the long term, yeah. not that's today, a, not today, in great, the long term. That's kind of like the Trojan horse of questions, Ali, because inside, <laughs> inside are all these other little questions, right? So, I mean, you know, what's, what is policy making? What do we teach our students, right? Or at least what do I teach my students? That there are no, there, there are no good choices. Hmm. That for the biggest challenges and for crisis situation, there's least worst choices. And from the US perspective, I would guess that the least worst choice is to go after Russia as hard as possible and make them pay as steep a price as possible for what they have done and get them out of Ukraine, full stop. And that's going to come with a lot of collateral damage. And one side of that collateral damage we already discussed, right, which is like the human toll, which is really awful, actually. But the other side is what you just mentioned, which is how will China China, you know, and the companies that you mentioned, state-owned companies in particular, these are the opportunists par excellence, right? And so it doesn't surprise me that they're snapping up these like, you know, devalorized or whatever devalued assets, nor does it surprise me that they're snapping up and they're not the only ones like, you know, discounted oil, right? From the Chinese. Although I think that that's, that's becoming and will become increasingly difficult to do yeah. just because insurance rates, freight rates, uh, all kinds of other logistical problems, the fact that companies, even some state-owned companies, like do business in other countries, like in Europe, in the United States, and maybe are a little bit kind of like risk averse. So I don't think that, so that's number one. Number two is, you know, why should we assume that China is like net winner, right? China's losing as much as they're winning. You, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know how to evaluate. First of all, because it's too early to tell. But you know, how did the Belt and Road Initiative yeah. first get like launched? It got launched as an essentially an overland Eurasian, Eurasian project, which acquired like this maritime Silk Road dimension, which then weaved the Middle East and the Gulf into it. Okay. And so you have all of these like um, uh, uh, you know, visions and realities of East-West. Um, transport corridors, you know, half of which go through Russia. Okay. Um, you know, what is this going to do yeah. to the Eurasian vision, you know, and the material? It seems to me that there's going to be, and there probably is already, a significant disruption mm -hmm. of, of freight and cargo traffic. Um, you know, some people have said, you know, but I immediately like, like, just to be devil's advocate, fought back, said that, ah, so the time is right for the middle corridors now to kind of pick up the slack and replace Russia. There's no replacement for Russia. I mean, these are multimodal systems that require from the Chinese side, like substantial subsidies. And we saw over the last five, six years that like, you know, different institutions, that command a lot of, it seems to me, like financial authorities saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, too expensive, too risky. Right. These are not good. These, are, these, these, these systems are not like instantaneously poised to replace Russia. So I think, you know, the Chinese are winning in one respect, but they're being disrupted in another respect. And, you know, energy security, of course, has got to be top of the line priority for them. But I mean, you know, commerce with Europe is like really key. I mean, when you when you when they talk about the maritime and the overland connectivity, okay, it's going through the Middle East, but the destination is Europe. Yeah. You know? 
And, and, you know, Africa, okay, you know, we're waiting for the explosion of the population to translate into the explosion of these kind of, you know, dynamic markets. Well, we've got a long time to wait for that. But Europe is the, is the, is the market of choice. And so I, I just don't see, um, like, in, in the immediate future that the Chinese have won substantially more than, than they might be at risk of losing, at least in the short term. Final thing I would say is about sanctions, easier to put on than to take off. Here I see the United States kind of like bedeviled by its own policy because you can't be telling the Russians in the world, uh, look, on this calendar date, we're gonna start removing these sanctions in this order, okay? Because you know, essentially when you do that, you're, you're, you're allowing them the convenience of playing for time, right? And, and, at the same time, though, you know, it seems to me you do need to like lay out some kind of an end game here just in order to for the practical purpose of maintaining solidarity among those countries that are imposing the sanctions because, you know, I mean, are we looking at like permanent sanctions? I, 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 sanctions? I, John, I, I, I hear you loud and clear and I will make it short, but I think what we've seen after even JCPOA that none of the Europeans really went in wholeheartedly, no bank touched it. So I think the air of sanctions is gonna be there to hang far longer then even if you come to a resolution, a JCPOA or a treaty between Russia and Ukraine and all of that. So I think the ramifications of sanctions are chronic and a long time in order to rebuild trust in financial institutions in particular, which are the enablers of trade. That was my point, not to say, I see, I see. <laughs> we'll, we'll take yeah. you off, you know, it's- No, uh, no, I, I see, yeah. It, and it, I, it's, I, it's like vitamin, I don't know, uh, vitamin S is sanctions, but time relief, you know, it's gonna take- time relief. Yeah, yeah, nice, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. yeah, I think, I, I, I see your point and, and it's a great point. Um, Having John. made that point, then maybe I shoot the question back to you and to Anoush. What would this chronic condition then mean for, uh, for Russia, for Russia's relations with China, for stability in the peripheral regions of Russia? I mean, is a, is a weak Russia, a chronically weak Russia, yeah. like in the long-term interests of, of, of the so-called West, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, in one respect, you know, it is because it may defang Russia or it may undermine, you know, the political will and capacity to repeat this kind of, you know, inexcusable territorial aggression, not to mention the humanitarian catastrophe that it has unleashed. You know, on the other hand, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, what does it mean for the Russian people, for or for Russian nationalism, or for you know, if if Putin eventually loses power, you know, what, what, what how how might the next iteration of Russian leadership look at this period, and how might they seek to exploit it? So I think there's a lot of questions that that need to That's be subject answered. for another BRI episode, John. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> We've got to, yeah. But but you know, John, the one thing that that when I'm looking back at, at the historical record that actually a defeat in a self-proclaimed war can have devastating consequences for, for the aggressor, whether it is Nazi Germany, whether it is uh, Argentina in, in 1982, um, and, and whether it is Iraq against Iran and Kuwait and so on, that actually a self-proclaimed warrior in this case, Russia, that has got kind of might and just and virtue on its side, actually loses a war, can can have far-reaching consequences for the state. And given that Russia is as multinational as India, you wonder what what whether the whole Russian state could shrink in proportion which has all sorts of ramifications for the Russo speakers of Kazakhstan to Georgia, to Moldova, right into Russia itself, of course, where the Tatars sit at the very heart of this Eurasian empire. So yeah, this is fascinating, but, but I wanna go back to China's predicament that you've, you've 
very right and interestingly kind of uh, on 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 pact. You know, yet until this war, my reading of the Chinese narrative was that actually connectivity is a linear process that we we kind of go down these roads we 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 put the asphalt down we put the concrete down we put the steel down and then it it works what this war has shown them as much as anybody else is actually there is nothing linear about this kind of process how how are they going to adjust to this given that as you rightly say that there is now this massive vacuum in the BRI, not just Russia, but of course also Ukraine. Ukraine was fundamental right, to right. getting this into, into continental Europe as well. I, you know, I mean, they've, they've got one hell of a mess on their hands, right? That, that's a great point. I hadn't thought of it in, in, in quite the way that you've, you've described it, but I, I think you're right. Um, of course, I think that even before this crisis, um, there were some adjustments, but probably not as significant maybe as they will have to be uh, in, in light of the implications of the war as you describe them, right? I mean, there was already, I think, I mean, there was a, a rebound in terms of engagement, whether you wanted to find that engagement in investment terms, loans, contracts, you know, in 2021 over 2020. But I don't even think looking back, I mean, but I, I saw actually that was an incremental change. I don't think that we were ever going to see necessarily going to see like the amounts of financial power deployed in really big projects that we saw from 2013 to let's say 2019. So I think that game was already over. Um, that's number one. I think maybe the, even before, I think the idea was less money, less risk, smaller projects, let's continue. Um, I think the momentum though has to be linear, even though the conditions may be inconducive <laughs> to linearity. And the, and the reason for that is just because this is Xi Jinping's baby. You know, I think the political compulsions, they, they, unless they can find a way to restructure the narrative that makes it look like a reshaping of the BRA, to accommodate these changes, unless they can find a way out, they're in, uh, and they and they gotta be in this year because this is the you know the fateful year of the People's Congress and the kind of you know his lasting imprint on Chinese history and his propulsion into you know I don't know number one guy indefinitely. So I think it's really interesting, you know. I think the political how would you say compulsions are maybe. At, at odds with what maybe needs to happen, which is some kind of a maybe more fundamental rethink of the BRI for the reasons that you described, Anush. Well, John, we couldn't uh, ask for a more um, engaged, informative, wise uh, 45 minutes of your precious time. <laughs> we, 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 have a, we have a ritual that we bring these sessions to an end by me asking two simple, very simple questions from people like yourself and our dear guests. And then Anoush closes it. So my two questions for you, John Calabrese, sitting in Washington, D.C., are what are your two most important pieces of advice to cinephobes and cinephiles? The cinephobes in Washington and the cinephiles around the world. What is, what is the two dispensing messages that you like to leave these two cohorts with at the end of BRI Dialogues? Okay, um, advice number one uh, to my uh, U.S. esteemed U.S. Uh, academic uh, colleagues and policymakers. Uh, number one, do not demonize China. Be selective in terms of the types of Chinese activities on the commercial and other side, the other fronts 
um, in terms of what you try to cajole and maybe coerce traditional partners on. That would be number one, selectivity. Number two, uh, try to arrest the free fall of the relationship by acting on your word, which is there are areas where Chinese and American or Chinese and transatlantic relations right. overlap, public health, uh, in spite of the poisoning uh, of the relationship to some extent because of the way of the mishandling of the COVID virus, right? Um, public health, climate change, hmm. you know, um, developing maybe not necessarily collaborative projects, right? But complementary projects that that are you know sustainable green projects um, in the global south, you know. So those would be my two um, pieces of advice. Thank you. Brilliant. I'm gonna start working on a banner, uh, John Calabresi for for DC district uh, in Congress, so that you can begin to make make an impact. Although I know that's not the world that you have any ambition in, in entering, John. Uh, <laughs> I've loved uh, having you with us um, and, and discussing as we've done so many interesting issues, but the way that you've so intricately managed the discussions and take them and the, the dialogue through uh, the afternoon has just been absolutely fantastic. And I should, of course, for the record, commend you for being the first person in the US to actually put China Middle East relations in the record at the Middle East Institute where you started the dialogue that is now a profound source of information on relations between East Asia and West Asia. Uh, you pioneered it, John, you, you, you are too humble to acknowledge it, but we, the rest of the world, have really benefited from it. So I should thank you for that as much as being our guest on Bear Our Dialogues, Dr. Calabresi. You've been a fantastic and masterful guest to have. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you both for the opportunity. Please keep well, get better, Anoush, and, uh, and, and good luck. Love, love, love to the family.